You're listening to Lake Hills Talks. I'm Judson Schmucker, and this is Pastor Jacob Riggs, and this is Season 1, Episode 8, where we're going to talk about legalism. Heavy subject, right? Um, Depends on if you think you're a legalist or not. (laughs) (laughs) It could end up like a ton of bricks on your shoulders. Um... But before we, like, so a lot of people probably can come up with a lot of different definitions. Of legalism? Right. Mm -hmm. They might say this is legalism or that is legalism Mm -hmm. or whatever the Mm -hmm. case. And the word itself could be used as, like, a a sledgehammer whenever we just don't want to do something. (laughs) Yeah. You're just being a legalist. You're just being a legalist. Yeah, it could be a word that's tossed around that is used inappropriately, um, maybe to bully. Sure. To... uh, Ma- no, nobody wants to be a legalist. No, I don't. I don't think that's a condition people are looking for. Right. We need to talk about what is it. So, yeah. what do you think, Jacob? Let's. That's uh, a good question. What is legalism? And it's good because it's number one on our list. It is number one. So it seems to me, and it seems to us, I guess we were talking about this before we started recording. There's different layers, I guess, mm. of legalism. R.C. Sproul talks about this in an article that people can find if they just Google R.C. Sproul. Um, that's the letter R, the letter C, and the S-P-R-O-U-L. He's a deceased pastor, theologian. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you just Google... Wrote a lot of books. Yep. If you just Google R.C. Sproul, three types of legalism, you can find this article. Um, and so what we're about to say is kind of loosely based on that. He doesn't really define it as clearly as we're going to try to. But he talks about three different kinds of legalism. The first one, I think, is is when somebody is trying to earn God's favor for their salvation or their justification. So anything that somebody does that they're relying on Mm. to make them right with God other than Jesus Christ and what he's done, I think could be defined as a kind of legalism. Yeah. Do you think that in the moment that's what's going through someone's mind? Or do you think that's hindsight being twenty twenty, looking back in time and being like, oh, I was trying to earn my favor versus in the moment of saying, you know, I just have to like clean up my foul language before God will love me. Yeah. No, I don't think that they're cognitively recognizing that they're being legalistic in that way. Otherwise, why would they do it? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a misunderstanding of the nature of justification by faith. Mm -hmm. You're counted righteous just because of what Jesus has done, period. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of it comes into play when we, by the use of the term, by by the definition of justification, which a lot of people get half right. Okay. Which they say it means justified, never sinned. Mm. That's only half right. Because it's justification by faith doesn't, make you a uh, give you a clean slate to try harder next time Mm -hmm. it's actually the imputed righteousness of christ on your account so that you're just as righteous as christ is Mm -hmm. in god's eyes that's Mm -hmm. justification by faith yeah and that happened just by trusting and accepting what christ has done for you on the cross nothing else right that's the heart of the good news it's the Mm -hmm. heart of the gospel and so any time somebody says, well, Jesus loves me, this I know, but I'd also better be baptized too, mm. or I also had better join this church, or I had better do this or whatever. I better go to Wednesday night Bible study. I better go to Sunday school. I better, I better, I better, I better. I better, yeah. Thinking and believing that that somehow results in God's favor. Mm-hmm that makes you in right relationship Mm -hmm. with the Father is a kind of legalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a trusting in your own righteousness. And Paul talks about this very strongly in the book of Galatians. Yeah. He says, if righteousness is through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Mm -hmm. Righteousness through the law, meaning if you could make yourself right with God by obeying God's law, then logically, in Paul's mind, Jesus' death was pointless. Unnecessary. 
Yeah. Why would he need to die? Mm-hmm. In that case, Jesus is a good example, but he's not necessarily a substitute. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, Jesus is just a little bit better than Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. You know, there's actually an ancient heresy called Pelagianism mm-hmm. uh, or yep. semi Pelagianism that believed something similar. A man named Pelagius who believed that Adam and Eve. Um, sinned, but the only reason that people sin after Adam and Eve is because they see poor examples. Mm -hmm. That sinfulness is not imputed to them. They just see poor examples. And if we just give people positive examples, then they can live righteous lives. And therefore, I mean, the problem with it is you don't need Jesus' death and substitutionary Mm -hmm. atonement. It's it's a kind of legalism behind it. You know, that, that entire concept flies in the face of our culture so what concept uh the whole justification by faith alone Mm -hmm. where if you go you know in the second world in the the business world right if i want to get promoted i have to do all these good things and prove it right and then i get the reward quote Mm -hmm. unquote and then i have to um continue maintain it maintain it that's right you don't want a sophomore slump right what? Sophomore slump. You never heard that no. before? No. What, what does that a mean? A sophomore slump is a musical term. Do you like how I agreed to that first? And then I was like, time out. I'm glad what? you didn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you didn't agree when you didn't really know what it meant. So it's a musical term. Let's say um, Taylor Swift has a great first <gasps> album. I don't know what her first album was, but let's say she has a What's great first album. Taylor Swift? Well, she's got to produce another album. Mm-hmm. That would be a sophomore album. Oh, sophomore Sophomore. What did Got you think it. I was saying? I thought you said slothmore. Slothmore like works. Slothmore. Like I, 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 Slugworth, Slothmore. I didn't know what you were saying. I just. I feel like we're getting into Harry Potter world now. Never saw it. Because you're legal. Because because that would be wrong, and that would that would <laughs> that, was a that great would segue re- you like back that? into our topic. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And so. W- w- I know that tune. Yeah. I think I saw that like on a reel or something. But yeah. That was good. You, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <Okay. laughs> but 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 that's the idea is that this – what the gospel is is so counter how we do everything else in our life, almost everything else in our life. Mm-hmm. We are constantly bombarded with the you have to measure up for me to provide something that you want mm-hmm. or something that you mm-hmm. deserve. Right. Instead of being unmerited favor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And it's hard for people to say – well, then 99% of my life is performance. Mm-hmm. Then I get rewarded. Right. And then the gospel says, stop performing. Somebody has already performed. Right. They've already done it. You never can. It's done. It's over. It's finished. And your attempts to perform shows a lack of reliance on the one who has. Mm-hmm. And that's why this is such a problem. This part of legalism is such a problem. And it literally pushes you away it it pushes you away from god the father but your brain says this should bring me closer that's right it's a lie from the devil Mm -hmm. the father of lies amen Mm -hmm. yep a liar and a loser but i think there's a second kind of legalism though and i want to shift to to you because this is the one that you were talking about more i think you have more of a grasp on this uh and you use the word guardrails for Mm -hmm. this and i use the phrase extra Rules, we might call it a self reliant, um, practical holiness, a self reliant Christian growth kind of thing. Talk about yeah. that. What do you mean when you say like guardrails for a Christian? Can I use a metaphor? Please, guardrails is a metaphor. Yeah, I'm going to expand on that metaphor. Okay. So you're driving on the highway because you want to go to Chicago. That's what you want to do. For whatever reason, you're going to go see a show. Cubs are playing the Reds. Cubs are going to play the Reds, right? They're going to lose. Yep. Uh, well, they're playing the Yankees, actually, later this year. Did you know that? Don't care about that, but I know your father-in-law does. Yeah, we're going to the game. It's going to be a good time. Anyway, so you're going well, to the game. Well, with that said, we're going to the game. And at some point in times past, people drove off the highway. Mm-hmm. And so somebody said, let's put a rumble strip there. Mm-hmm. So when you go over to the rumble strip, you and you go, oh, oh, oh I'm falling off the road, mm-hmm. right? And then the guardrail wasn't good enough, or the rumble strip wasn't good enough. So then somebody said, let's put a concrete barrier mm-hmm. so you don't drive off into the ditch. Mm-hmm. So not only is it not enough to hit the 
on the highway, but then you crash into a wall and you go, mm-hmm. at least I'm not in the ditch. Right. Right. Why right. can't we, why wouldn't like this? And I'm not going back to the justification part, but the concept is, is that in order for me to get to my destination, I need these additional guardrails to maintain my trajectory. The destination is, in this case would be heaven. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's kind of my metaphor. As a Christian, as a Christian, you, you put these guardrails up to, to make sure that you don't go off a ditch and lose your faith, basically. Right. Yeah. Or, or fall into sin. Or, or fall into sin. Yeah. And so you, you're trusting in these rules, these regulations, these guardrails. You're trusting in them to maintain your holiness. You're trusting in them to keep you from sin. You're, you're not relying on the power of God that lives within you, the Holy Spirit, to, as we've been saying in Colossians, if Christ is supreme, then he's also sufficient, mm-hmm. not only to save, but to sustain and perse- persevere you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's a, st- there's a step here where you could say, okay, I trust in Christ for my justification, but he's not going to get me to the finish line. So I now have to add these guardrails. I have to put these extra rules in. I have to live above the line because what Christ has done isn't good enough to keep me or and to grow what me. Christ is what Christ is doing is not enough. Yes, what Christ is doing. What he has done in mm-hmm. his work on the cross, we're trusting justification. That. Right. Now we're talking like a progressive sanctification. Okay. A growth in your life. It's the opposite it's it's Philippians one six um, for what he started he will finish for yes. what God has started he will finish. You, what you're saying is God started it but he's not going to finish it. Mm. I have to finish it. Yes. And in order for me to finish it, I know he'll be proud of me if I create these guardrails. Right. If I create this protective because I really want to finish and I really I, does that come from a right heart, a heart that says I I hate sin and I don't want to sin. That's the right motive. Isn't Absolutely, it? I, th- I think I definitely think there's a part of that for sure, and I think it um, from that point. I think every rule, every regulation, no, I don't think anyone started off and said, "How do I make this difficult and hard?" I don't think any of those really started from a n- adverse motive. I think they probably started with, "How do I just protect? How how do I be responsible? How do I keep it safe?" Um, and then maybe like the first person, right, that has that guardrail has the right motive. But what it teaches somebody who's looking at you, who's watching you, maybe whom you pass it on to, you're teaching them that it's the rule that sustains, not Christ. Okay. And so, you know, I, I think this is um, – I think we say this a lot. Like we, we don't want our kids to follow our faith because it's our faith. It, it's their faith with Christ. It, but it sometimes a, a child will say, "Mom, Dad, I, I want to be baptized. I want to be saved." And they're doing it because it's what well, we are, what we want. They're going to get a party, after and they're going to get a party after it, right? And then and they're going to get and their friends gonna get, did. Yeah, yeah. And so um, th- they might be trusting in like I think that's where the danger comes into play. Is that like the the rule might be a good heart motive, keep you. It might be motively correct. But then it becomes the answer as to how it's maintained, mm-hmm. and it's absent of Christ in and of himself. Right. The passages that are coming to mind is what Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, then fruit will abound. Mm-hmm. The, go- the way to get fruit, growth in godliness, is by our relationship with Jesus. Yes. He is what produces the fruit in us fruit of the Spirit. Jesus is called the Spirit. Um, they're really closely, they're not the same person, but I mean, they're, they're buddy, buddy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're right there. <laughs> yeah. He said, I will send, I think he said, I will send my Spirit. So it, the Spirit exalts Christ, mm-hmm. you know, so that's a hard thing for some people to, uh, to do. It, it does take work in a way to rely on Jesus, to speak spend time with him, to seek him. Um, But it's not so much putting guardrails up. Now let's shift. Can you give me an example of a guardrail or two? Um, So we... I'll give you one. Yeah. So 
premarital sex is sin. Yes. Holding hands with your boyfriend or girlfriend, is that sin? No. It's not sin. But that would be a guardrail. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it absolutely could be a guardrail because somebody would try to say, if I hold their hand, it will tempt me to sin. Therefore, I will not hold their hand. Mm -hmm. And you can say, that logically sounds correct. Where is Christ in that equation? Mm -hmm. The answer is nowhere. You made up your own rule. Mm -hmm. You said, I know I can't control me, so I'm going to remove the opportunity to control me. You're not even giving Christ the opportunity. You're, you're stifling him. You're quenching him, his, the spirit, from even being powerful in your life by saying, stay back. I got this, God. You don't have to be a part of the equation. I'll make sure that you can have a day off, but I'll take control of this. I don't think that's a cognizant thought. Not a cognizant thought, no, but that's what you're saying. Are you saying that... Whenever our children get older and they start dating, we should just give them green light as long as they don't have sex. That's a leap. I, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, no, I know. I yeah, but I, I would say you, you, we just stepped over a lot of rocks in the pond to get to the other side on that equation. Okay. Right. So. So you're saying the question is, how do I honor Christ in this relationship? Yes. Lord, how do you want me to honor you Mm -hmm. in this relationship? Right. And whatever that looks like is appropriate. I think you have to search the Lord for what he's going to tell you. And his word. And his word. Right. So this is not subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, There's one thing to say, hey, um, I don't want to – I don't don't want to look at pornography. mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ask my friends what do they do. And then they're going to say, well, I put this software on my computer, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And you go, okay, great. I'm going to go do that now. I'm going to go download the software. Let me pay the whatever fee it is per month. Let mm-hmm. me get rid of uh, cable television. Let me block all the internet websites. Get an accountability Let's partner. get an accountability partner and do all those things. And while those things can be helpful, when, have, when in that equation did I say, I want to search the Lord to protect and sustain me? Where did I say in that equation, I want the Lord to protect my mind and my heart? Yes, amen. And uh, to enjoy the Lord. And to, and, and, to, and to enjoy the way he has created life to be in his, in his intent, not my intent, but his intent. Mm-hmm. Where have I found the joy in what he's created for me? All I'm saying through utilizing these secondary means to maintain my holiness mm-hmm. is I need, to be, I need to be a killjoy. And I need to say what God's intended is not possible. Therefore, I need to take control and take the reins Mm -hmm. by creating these rules, Mm -hmm. regulations, guardrails, rumble strips. Which is really, I'm going to hate and it's going to be miserable for me. Yeah. But in the end, I'll go to heaven and that'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. I'm going to white knuckle it. I'm going to grind my teeth. I'm going to tie it by bootstraps Mm -hmm. and I'm going to struggle and hate this for the rest of my life. Or you could, and this is, I'm just hyper talking now, or I could like really enjoy and love the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I could love to serve him and to work in the way that the word of God tells us to work and to live and to be. And then I can take joy in that. And that joy is not, it's not tying up my bootstraps and white knuckling it and just like forcing it. It's taking joy and letting the word of Christ empower me. So this can only happen until we start talking about and understanding the role that idolatry plays Mm -hmm. in our sin. Tim Keller has a lot of books about this. Yeah, that's really good. Because... Prodigal God. Prodigal God? That's the one where you're... I'm thinking of counterfeit gods. Oh, counterfeit God. You're right. By Tim Keller. Yes, yes. So Keller and others talk about this. They talk about... Surface idols and heart idols. Mm -hmm. And he says that our sin is, um, all all of our different sins are connected to different kinds of idols. Something that we're looking to, to bring us satisfaction, fulfillment, security, contentment, something like that. Could be power, could be safety, 
something like that. Um, and our sin is we're, we're looking for those things in our hearts by the thing, by looking at pornography. Maybe it's feeling accepted or something. And the only way to actually free yourself from that is to consider what it is that your heart is actually after and then to realize that God actually does that for us in mm-hmm. Christ. Yeah. That acceptance that you might be looking for in that pornography or that feeling of control because I, everything else in my life is crazy, but I can control this, you know? Well, we, you really can't control that because it goes out of control quickly, our sin does, and, but also the gospel actually frees us from that because the God who sent his son for us is in control of all things and has us in the palm of his hands. And so now that actually frees up. It, it replaces our heart idols with a real God, yeah. the God of the Bible. And we, so where I was going with that is the only, that's the only way to actually serve God with joy without actually putting up those guardrails for being, dread, for being drudgery or whatever. But when we realize that God is our joy, he is our safety, he is our security, he replaces those idols, now um, not looking at pornography or whatever is not a burden. It's actually a joy, even if it is challenging and difficult at times. There's a verse that's popping into my head right now. There's a verse that's popping into my head right now. And um, I'm struggling to find it, so I'm trying to do a quick search. But it's... um, It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Thanks. I figured I'd start there. It's a great place. Um, I'm not going to find it right now. But it's... Oh, um, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Because what's coming out of the mouth is what is deep down within your heart, that idol. That is what's defiling you. Mm-hmm. It's not the rules that you're going to put into you. It's, it's already, you're already defiled inside, but you're already struggling with sin. You're saved. I get it. You're justified. But you still have sin in you that needs to be quenched. It needs to be removed. And so if you don't recognize that, would you say that's a fair, would you say that verse is speaking to that? Yes, I think that's related to it. What yeah. comes out of the mouth is, is from the heart. But sometimes we say that's the sin is out there. It's not actually in me. Okay. I'm not struggling with sin. Okay. So I need to make sure that sin doesn't come into me. Protect me from sin. Correct. So I need a guardrail for it. I and see. the problem is, is that, yeah, external influences will aggravate and agitate and inflame that sin that's already within you. The lust of the flesh, the lust lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then also James, where sin starts in you, it grows, and then it gives birth. Mm -hmm. Or temptation is already in you, Mm -hmm. and then it grows, and then it gives birth to sin. Gives birth to death, but yeah. Death, yes. Um, But sin is actually, indwelling sin is actually in us as Christians. It's not external, is what you're saying. Yes, it's actually within us. And so if we're doing all these external measures to keep the sin from getting within us, we're not handling the sin that's in us by the power of the Word of God. We're saying, by the power of the Word of God or by the power of His Spirit, we're not inviting Him into the equation. We're saying, God, I've got this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me to the party, Mm -hmm. but I'll make the food from here. Mm -hmm. Right, right. There's a third kind of legalism, and this is the one that I think is maybe the most challenging to discern Mm -hmm. I call it conviction projection conviction a conviction is something that you feel impressed maybe even by your own conscience maybe even by the Holy Spirit to abstain from or to do that for you you need to do that but it might not necessarily be something that every Christian has to do. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example in my own personal life. Uh, Lindsay and I do not watch rated R movies. The Passion of the Christ is rated R. Mm. No. So 
could we it's a, I would say it's a conviction mm-hmm. of mine to not watch rated R movies. I have really good reasons to not do that. Mm-hmm. But I would say that's probably a conviction. I wouldn't say that no Christian should ever watch a rated R movie. I think that's projecting my conviction onto someone else. That's different than I than what you're talking about from the the guardrails thing. Right. Because in this third one, in this conviction projection, it could be the Holy Spirit that's prompting you to say, for your own sake, your dad was an alcoholic and your mom, alcoholism runs in your family. Mm -hmm. You probably shouldn't touch it at all. Like not even a sip of wine at a toast at a wedding. Mm -hmm. That might be wisdom and you might have a conviction to do that. But whenever we start to project our convictions and require every Christian to follow that conviction, I think is a kind of legalism. Yeah. Thoughts on that? There's a term that's coming to my head, the difference between conviction and gospel. A phrase, you mean? That phrase is what's coming to your head? Is it a conviction or is it gospel? Right. And by gospel, you mean the law, like everybody has to do it. Yes, like, is Jesus God? Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not just a conviction that I can believe, but you don't have to. Mm-hmm. Like, you got to believe that Jesus is God to believe that there's a gospel. To be a Christian. To be a Christian. Right. Like, that's that's like a, we're, we're going to die on that hill. You're not a Christian if you don't believe that. Correct. If, if Jesus is not God incarnate, the fullness of the deity dwelling within him, then... If you don't believe if that. If you don't believe that, then you are not a Christian. You can say whatever you want. You're not. Period. Right. Um, That's true. What you just said is a conviction. It's not gospel. Therefore, it's, it's not a requirement for every Christian everywhere to follow. Correct. Is there wisdom? Sure. Based on the scenario you just played out. And we could play a ifs and buts all day long on every scenario in the world. But the, dif- but the, the, the definition, maybe I'm stretching a definition of conviction, but conviction is like independent of the group. It's not universal. It's based on an individual, yeah. you're saying, and an individual circumstance and yes. situation. Yeah. Somebody who has a gambling problem, <laughs> it's, I'm not saying don't live in Vegas. What I'm saying is, is that person would probably be more struggled with a gambling is- addiction if they were in Vegas. Why? Because there's 800,000 casinos there. It's really that many? That seems know. like a lot. I have no idea. There's a lot. The gambling's not my thing. I'm glad. Thanks. <laughs> right. But 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 the point is like the scenario you just laid out, right? Rated R movies, mm-hmm. right? Um, drinking, having alcoholism in your family. Like we can say those sound like logical convictions, but we're not going to go to people and be like because this happened, you should also. Mhm. Mhm. So I'm thinking of the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Corinthians, Galatians. So um, this is about the food offered to idols Mm. passage. And you're familiar with this, I know. The word he uses in this chapter is conscience instead of conviction. Um, For example, he says in chapter 10, verse 27, um, actually verse 25, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He says in verse 27, If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're supposed to, you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you, for the sake of conscience. And I mean your conscience, but his. So it's the idea of Christian liberty. Mm -hmm. Your conscience doesn't condemn you. Therefore, you have the Christian liberty as long as God's word doesn't say that you shouldn't do it. um, Then you have the liberty to do it or not do it. But if somebody else's conscience does condemn them, even though God's word does not say, then you should be willing to give up your liberty for their sake in certain situations. Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. The, the, the legalist in this third category is somebody who says, 
this is my conscience, and you must follow my conscience. And if every Christian does not follow my conscience, then they are sinning as a result. That's a kind of legalism is what I'm talking yes. about. And there's all kinds of situations that this could apply to. And I'll just mention some of them, like wearing certain things when the saints gather. Mm-hmm. Um, all kinds of different things. Like there's there's no New Testament dress code. Dress code, Bible translation, type of music, um, whether you stand or you sit. Or how frequently you do it. Mm-hmm. Or who sings what, when, so many things this could apply to. Mm-hmm. Whether you have a church building or not, mm-hmm. um, all of those things. Raise are, your hands in church, don't raise your hands in church. Clap after a song, huh? not clap after a song. I'm not a clapper. Is it because of the rhythm thing? Yes. Thank okay. you. Why does my problems always get projected across these podcasts. I don't know. Maybe is it because you just notice them more? I think it's because you're just nicer than me. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's probably you're just nicer than me. Is what it is. No. So, I mean, I'm just having no, been for, in the Midwest for, enough. For the record, I can't clap on beat. Yes, I you can. You I, can play the guitar. Uh, I can tap my foot. It's weird. I could like I could never play you can the tap drums. Tap your foot, but you yeah. can't tap your hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just really? I don't know. I'm broken. I don't know. Sin still dwelling there. There might be a, like a wire crossed. In there's the brain. Def- there's a lot of. I think I got some wires missing. Okay, because uh, there is definitely. I, I'm not capable of doing it. I'm just not. I just I just always get off beat. There are so many worse things. I'm. St- I like my problems. There we go. <laughs> Great. Can I read? Um, Please. Another verse? Yeah. And you tell me if this applies. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Romans 14, 20. That's where I'm going. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Amen. Yes, that does apply very well to the, to what we're talking about. Yes, it does. So there's lots that we could talk about in this chapter, in Romans chapter 14. Um, it's not just the Corinthians that struggled with this. It's it's also the Baptists and the Presbyterians and lots of Christians. Pretty much wherever there are humans. Yeah. And the verse that so, seems so strange to us is Romans chapter 14, verse 14. It says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it. Mm-hmm. unclean. I'm understanding that to mean when it says who thinks it unclean, I'm understanding that to mean a conscience thing. So yes. it violates your conscience. You believe that doing this thing is wrong. He uses the word unclean. This is unclean. We should not do it. Now, and he says, look, there's nothing unclean in and of itself. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with fermented grape juice. Like, that's just not how sin works. It's not intrinsically right. evil, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that's mysticism, actually. That's a weird kind of religion. Um, you mix these potions together. Right, and evil dwells and in evil this potion. And evil dwells in that potion. Right. That's right. not... <laughs> that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Right. Right. Nothing is unclean in itself. But if somebody thinks that they should not do it, then therefore they should not do it. And it, I think what he's talking about in Romans 14 is being respectful yes. to that person's conscience mm-hmm. for what they understand they're doing to obey the Lord and to be faithful to him. 
That could mean that I'm I'm just gonna say this. I don't think there's anything wrong with the length of your pants as a man when you gather with the saints. Now, there's something like if it's too high, then it's just inappropriate and distracting, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's certain things that you should be willing to give up for the sake of someone else, even though you know there's nothing wrong with that. Because it's not about you. It's not about you at all. The other thing in this text that I want to point out is that it's very clear the text doesn't say you who have this conviction go make other people convicted the same way. It says recognize the convictions other people have and for their sake not yield but respect it. And we like to say these are my convictions Mm -hmm. and therefore you need to have the same. Mm -hmm. And nowhere does the scripture say that. Mm -hmm. At least in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians, was it 10? I also want to point out that causing your brother to stumble is making them feel like they should do what actually violates their conscience. Making them stumble is not making them upset that you don't have the same conviction. Yes. That's actually a sign of Phariseeism. Do you understand what I'm yes. saying and the difference? So let's use uh, the pants thing, the shorts and the pants thing as an example. Judson decides he wants to wear knickers on Sunday morning. What are knickers? Knickers. Can we define knickers? Knickers are like just below the knee with little scrunchies on them. Pants, pantaloons. See, Maybe I didn't grow up pantaloons. as a Christian, so I don't know all these fashion That's trends. That's not a Christian term. Oh, knickers is not a Christian term. Okay. Um, anyway, and you usually have socks pulled up, usually to the knee or above the knee, with the pants that go right below the knee. Is that like the sport? What's, I think. What's the, what's the sport that you can do? Uh, <laughs> Are you talking about the basketball team? No. The New York <laughs> Knickerbockers? No, no. Uh, what what is the, where like you have like the, it's like golf, but you got to get them through these little rings. Croquet? Cro- croquet? Croquet? Yeah. Crochet is, that, cro- is different. Crochet is different. That's, that's, that's that is, needle and thread. That's needle and threading, thing. yeah. But croquet, that's, they wear knickers with the high socks. The croquet players do? Sure. Let's leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> so, Judson, you want to wear knickers okay. on Sunday to church. Mm. Don't do that. I think that's just weird culturally, mm. and it would be distracting. Okay. But don't do that. But let's just say you want to, hmm. and you f- you think that it is. I think that it is wrong to do that. Hmm. Now, for you to say, um, to get me to stumble in this case, it would be for me to violate my conscience, and therefore wear knickerbockers myself. Because I'm convinced by your actions that it's actually okay. And now I'm hesitating. Like I feel wrong about this, but I guess I will. Therefore, you're, you're, you're encouraging me to sin in that way. Because to me, it feels like I shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to get somebody to stumble. Mm -hmm. Stumbling is not when you wear knickerbockers in your Christian liberty and you make me upset or self-righteously angry because you're doing that in your Christian liberty, but I don't have the liberty to do it. That's not making me stumble. Right. That's yes. just proving that I'm self-righteous. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I will not wear my knickers. 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 Is it knickerbockers? Knickerbockers. I'm confused now. That's a hotel in Chicago. Okay. Just saying. Great. So, okay. So, w- I think we've we got a good definition of what it legalism is. So, those three and what, kinds. what not what what isn't legalism. We didn't talk about that part yet. Okay. What isn't legalism? Okay. And this is important. So, what is not legalism? Obedience is not legalism. Just bottom line, if if God's word says you should do this, 
then doing what God's word says is just obedience. That's not being legalistic. So the scripture says, preach the gospel to everybody. Sure. Go to all the world, the Great Commission. So I say, I got to go do it. That's not legalism. No, that's just called obedience. Right. That's pretty clear. And somebody, it's important though, because some people could say, well, you're, don't be so legalistic. Mm. I have Christian liberty. Therefore, I don't have to do what the Bible says I should do. That just sounds wrong. It is wrong, and that's why it's important to point it out. But people do that. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, ah, you know, that church discipline stuff, that's just being relax. Just, you know, don't be so legalistic. Mm. Obedience is is not legalism. Um, And that needs to be said. Everybody's committing adultery. So just lay off. <laughs> no, everyone is not committing adultery, Justin. But a lot of people do it, and it's just we're just too harsh on it. You're just being too legalistic about it. That's not legalism, Judson. You keep using that word. <laughs> <laughs> I got you off guard there, didn't I? You keep using that word. I don't... You, you, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Go straight to jail. <laughs> what? That's you're combining references. I, I'm combining here. references. Yeah, but that's what's in my head. My name is Inigo Montoya. You <laughs> killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> you keep using you just keep using that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Well, I'm just telling you that's where my head went. Is <laughs> Not really straight to jail. <laughs> straight to jail. That's from Parks and Rec, right? Yes. Oh. Yeah. 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 You charge yeah. too much. For... <laughs> you charge too much. You go straight to jail. Yeah. You don't charge too much. Straight to jail. Straight to jail. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Straight to jail. Yeah. Straight to jail. <laughs> Believe it or not, jail. Jail. You overcook fish. <laughs> jail. Jail. You undercook fish. That's jail too. <laughs> yeah. Judson is tired. He I am so tired. tired. Oh. What's what's happening right now? We were talking okay. about legalism. We were talking about. Sex. I can't believe you watched that TV show, Jason. <laughs> it's just reels. <laughs> oh, I can't believe you have social media, Judson. Sorry, if you were really serious about your Christian walk. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I would. I can't. You're losing it. Yeah, okay, I'm so losing. three yeah. kinds of legalism. So, so three kinds of legalism. Give you, let me give us a summary here. Yeah. First kind is you just you're just not even Christian. It's mm. it's relying on something other than Jesus for your, to make you right with God. Right. The, um, that's has to do with your justification. The second kind is that guardrails. It's a lack of reliance on Jesus and your relationship with him for your actual progressive sanctification, for your growth and godliness as a Christian. And the third one is a conviction projection, um, which falls in the line of Christian liberty and conscience. And we talked about what legalism is not. It's not obedience. Hi, friends. That was Season 1, Episode 8. Thanks so much for listening. We actually had to split that conversation into two sections. So this was Part 1, where we define legalism. Part 2 will be released next week, where we ask some practical questions about legalism. Hope you'll stay tuned for that. If you do not have a church family and you live in Northwest Indiana, come be a part of our family. Join us at 8.30 or 11 a.m. on any Sunday. We'd love to get to know you and get you plugged into a life group and help you follow Jesus better or see where you can help serve the Lord Jesus at our church. Or if you have a good church in Northwest Indiana, then go ahead and stay there and serve the Lord faithfully. We're on the same team. For more information about our church, go to lakehillsonline.org. Talk to you later next week. Bye-bye.